This is the Self Taught or Not podcast with Dylan Israel and Eric Hanchett, where we teach you the do's and don'ts of software development from two software development professionals, one self taught and one not. And we're live. So today, Eric and I are going to be talking a little bit about um, me speaking at my first conference and just some general conference talk, like what to do when you want to go and go from being in the audience to being up on stage. Yeah, we have, I haven't talked to Dylan yet and has how his experience are doing his first conference talk, so I'm really interested in hearing about how it went and what he did to, to get prepared and, and everything along that process. And then we'd love to share with you guys listening like some tips that we have for conference talks. I think that a lot of people think of conference talks and it's almost has some parallels to like writing a book like we talked about in my, the book episode we did a little while back. Um, people get really scared. Like I can never do that, but I think a lot of people can and it has a lot of benefits. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, to put this out there, this was my very first talk and I had only gone to one other conference before this last one. And I was there with a buddy of mine. And uh, after a couple of these, I, I, I whispered to him in one of the talks, I said, I can do this shit. I think that was what direct quote, I can do this shit. And I was like, I'm going to do it next year. And he's like, yeah, yeah, sure you are. And, um, you know, for better or for worse, it, it went down. <laughs> so just in one, one year, you went from being a conference attendee to conference speaker. So that's, that's the power of cool conferences. I have, in the last few years, I've been doubling down on conferences. I just really enjoy them. I like the travel. I like meeting new people. Um, sometimes the conference talks aren't as important as just the people you meet. I think that that's I important, too. Yeah. And I, I do think that goes the same for speaking. Like, um, you know, from if we want to get into like just sort of the business aspect of you know, speaking at a conference, I can already tell you for me, there's been a lot of benefit. One, I can put that on my resume, on my LinkedIn. It's something employers and other devs like. They're like, this guy's passionate. This guy's the type of developer we're looking for. But from a networking perspective, I've already connected with several people on LinkedIn. When I was there, I was talking with a developer from Google, who's part of the Google Developer Expert Program, which if you're not familiar with the program, the general idea behind it is that Google has technologies and they certify non-Google individuals in those technologies. And you have to go take a test, but you have to be recommended by a Google employee. And so from him sort of talking to me and liking what I'm about, I now have somebody to go and recommend me for that program that I'll be doing in the next month or two. And, um, you know, not only that, being able to, connect i'm going on a, i'm going on a podcast uh I, I already went on a podcast the day i was there with um a thundernerds uh, dot io if i remember correctly if you want to check it out they interviewed all the guests from the podcast and so a little bit of self-promotion a little bit of fun you mean for the conference for the conference yeah and so um the, all the all the guests or excuse me all the uh speakers they interviewed them about 20 minutes a piece and i thought that was pretty cool because you get to not only talk about your talks or to shoot the shit a little bit never met these people and I'll be on a, another podcast called tech junior. And so you make a lot of these connections and it's, it's pretty cool stuff. Cool. Yeah. And of course the first thing you'll do when you get on those podcasts is, Hey, I'm Dylan from self taught or not. Right. Yeah. Oh, I did shill it nonstop. Uh, <laughs> that was so funny. Um, I'm all, and so like in my slides, I, I do my introduction and on there I have a tab called shilling. And so like, it's like the YouTube channel, the Facebook group, the podcast, all that, because, you know, you got to take advantage. Um, if you're, you know, cause going, speaking at a conference is, it's a, even though it's just like an hour or so, it's very time intensive. There's a lot of prep. And most of the time, it's not like I'm trying to sell something that people aren't interested in. People want, if they like you, they want to know where to find you and where to grow. Cause I, you know, and we'll talk about some mistakes I made, not even thinking about that. Uh, but there are people who are like, oh, man, this guy's cool. This guy, I like what he has to say. There's something I can learn or, you know, someone I just want to connect with to, to follow their career. Like, I don't talk with Quincy, but I follow sort of Quincy's career because I'm very interested in what he's got going on. No, that's cool. Let, let's deep dive in. Let's start from the beginning. Uh, usually, normally, typically, when you try to get into speaking at conferences, you create what's called a CFP, a call for papers. Sometimes I've heard of called RFP, um, but call for papers where you create basically an abstract, the title of the talk, you submit it on an 
website usually months before the conference starts and then they pick between all the different conference talks who they want to be there i think this one went a little different from you yeah it, it's some some similarities so um as i mentioned i i was like dude i'm gonna do this so about two weeks after that conference a year ago because they do this yearly it's uh the dev uh so the the conference i spoke at was dev fest florida and they have these dev fest events all over the place right and um i went to it's in orlando which is about two hour drive i went to it last year with the same buddy and i said i'm gonna speak at it and then i emailed them i simply emailed them two weeks after i said look i want i want in let me in uh very aggressively no but i basically said uh hey i'd like to speak um i have a little bit of a background not necessarily in conference speaking but i i do have you know um at that point we didn't even have the podcast but i had my youtube channel and the courses and um you know nowadays it might be even easier because we have the podcast where we're talking about these things and additional stuff but i sort of it's a little bit easier when you're you sort of have something that they can look at even if it's not a conference talk and so they said reach out uh, about three, four months before, you know, uh, October, November, and uh, and uh, let us, we'll, you know, we'll talk again in that. And so I did. I just followed up about six, eight months later, and they said, in the week, we're going to send you the survey form, sort of the CFP you described, and I submitted a very high level. No, no like syllabus. I was like, I want to talk about clean code and TypeScript, how to make our code more like literally I took a sentence out of the book clean code how to make our code more readable maintainable and testable so you you had met some of the conference goers and I bet it was probably very similar to yeah like normal like every everyday people they would just go to a website and submit the um, call for paper CFP but instead you had a little bit more of a connection that you could submit it I didn't other... meet anybody there beforehand like it wasn't like oh I, I was there and I was super the social butterfly and I was introducing myself to the staff no it didn't even occur to me to do that I wish I did but it no it, it didn't go down like that <laughs> but you at least had an email for somebody one of the organizers to uh, no not even that I literally went off the so the they have the um the main website for Def Fest. I emailed for DevFest Florida. I took the contact email and it's just essentially spammed until I got a response. No, that, that's one thing I've noticed too. Not all conferences are public call for papers. Some of them, um, you, you'd be surprised. A lot of conferences are invite only or they hand select who their speakers are because they're so popular. And some of them, um, usually almost every conference has at least one or two speaker spots where they invited the person. Um, so it's it is possible that you can get in another way that that's really takes a lot of initiative to just like look up the email address and email them yeah and i i think that you know from a sort of a higher level standpoint is that if you think opportunity is going to come to you you are very conceited and need to maybe get, like like it is a much easier world and to go about and get the opportunity than just to think that it's going to come knocking at your door. That may happen. Like nowadays there's some things that come say, Hey, would you want to do a sponsored video on our stuff and this and that? But if you're, if you don't have anything in the background to gain people's attention, you have to reach out, you have to do this, you have to do that. And if there's something you want to do, go for it and don't expect that it's going to come to you. And this is something that I wanted to do and I, I sort of pursued it. Yeah. That's, that's really great advice. You know, definitely everything in life, unless you have 50,000 Twitter followers and you're like a thought leader in the industry, you're not going to be invited to these conferences. People are not going to be hitting up your email, getting you over the, wanting you to come and talk for them. So you're going to have to work and people don't realize, no, that's okay. It's okay to email people and get rejected and, and go through that process. So let, let's continue on with the story. So you submitted it and then you heard back in a couple of weeks. Did you kind of go back and forth on the idea of the talk or did you, they pretty much accept it right away? Um, not really. So like, I was a little worried that I wasn't going to get accepted because I didn't hear like anything. And then I followed up again. So like, I'm a little neurotic, right? Because I'm like, I'm, I'm busy, right? I'm going out of town. I'm doing YouTube. <laughs> and, but I don't want to build this talk if I'm not going to use it. So I have to find the time. So I followed up about every two weeks. And by the sixth week, it's like, cool, your, your talk's accepted. Um, and then they'll follow up with more details about like, where, when, how much time you have. So um, but yeah, and I, I didn't even know up until about a month before, I wasn't sure if I was doing a 30 minute talk or a 50 minute talk, which, um, you know, it ended up not mattering cause I just did a, I, I, I had to cut some stuff for my talk to, because when I practiced it, it was longer, 
But um, and then I end up having a little bit of time because I talked too fast because I was uh, I was a little bit worried because the guy told me like, hey, we need you to speed up your talk a little bit because lunch went a little long. And so I, I lost like five minutes, but then I went too fast and then had a, a little bit longer for questions. I had like 15 minutes rather than 10. So that's during the talk. Let's mm-hmm. go back right before the talk. So what was so you got you got it. You went back and forth. They accepted it. Everything was good. You live in Florida, so there's no travel or anything involved other yep. than maybe you know an hour or two drive from your house. So you got to have something called a speaker's dinner. What is the speaker's dinner? And what- yeah, it was a um, baller ass event. No, uh, it was uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, it was at a essentially a restaurant slash bar that was connected to a mall, <coughs> and <coughs> they serve you know free drinks, free food, all that sort of stuff that you would expect. Uh, got to meet all the other speakers that were there. And that was, you know, I mentioned earlier about the Google developer expert and, you know, going on podcasts and I got to connect with all these people and really just sit down and talk shop for like two and a half hours. And I, I left a little early cause um, it took me two and a half hours to get there with traffic. And then, I, you know, I was getting up at five 30 to go and drive back to Orlando again. Uh, so uh, some of those guys I'm sure stayed late and really uh, dove in in deep but it was, it was a good thing especially because like there's not that many people that you can just sit there and t- and talk software with like for hours and hours and i mean we we sort of do it <laughs> because we, we have podcasts and but i would say nine out of ten devs it's like just a job to them and it is to me as well but like i it's part of my life as well so i i i, I love it in various aspects um but yeah so we were able to do that and just talk and they um they gave us this nice book and um it's called outliers and it's about um essentially being a different type of individual and succeeding with it and i thought that was sort of a interesting book because in in recent months i've been sort of describing myself as an outlier in certain aspects of my life and so i, I haven't had a chance to read it yet but i, I fully plan to but that, that's good you guys had a, a good dinner there so how did you prepare for the conference for your presentation did you so the the first thing i like to do in anything that i'm going into sort of blind is simply ask people who have done this before and so that's what i did i I, you know my tech lead i asked him if he had spoke at conferences and he said yeah and i said any tips he's like yeah um if you're gonna do a live demo make sure that you have slides for when when that shit doesn't work and so (laughs) and so i said i told him i said that was like some good uh, tips and so i was like instead of doing a live demo what i'll do because i wanted to cover quite a bit and i knew if i was going to type it out i was going to either you know you're gonna you're gonna type slower you're gonna you're gonna you i may not get to cover so i just went all slides and screenshots of code for stuff and it took me about a week and a half in total of working on it every single day to um generate it and it came out to about 60 slides i'd say maybe a little bit more um and um, I had sort of three main sections, but um, it that's what I did. And then I, I practiced by reading it to April uh, once, <laughs> basically. And so she was there and we threw it up on the TV and I, I connected the laptop and then I presented to her like I would if we had a larger audience. Wow. So just one time, huh? <laughs> yeah, but that's kind of how you roll. Like you, you, you don't, you know the stuff, you talk about it, you don't have to do a thousand yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I could have probably um, gone through this without any slides, but no one else would know what the hell I'm talking about. Uh, because, I mean, from this podcast, people are listening. Sort of the, one, of the, one of the interesting parts about it is you're a, you're a much more methodical guy in the sense of uh, you're, you like to be more prepared. I'm like, yo, it's all up here, baby. We're just gonna, and I'm pointing to my head. I know I guess there's no video for this, uh, but like we're just going to we're going to run it because I I. I don't know. I, most of the time it's sort of, um, I think Traverse media described left described it best in like a comment on a video of mine where we were talking about, I somehow I was talking about like my process and he called it organized chaos. And I think it's a very interesting way of putting it where all the information's there, but you don't necessarily need to put it on the, on paper because it's going to be, so it may not be organized to other people, but in our sort of chaotic mind, we're going to be able to pull the resource at any moment that we need, if that makes sense. And so it was very hard for me to a degree to actually sit down and make these slides because, and I, I, I would, I would definitely do that again because I do think it's necessary, but it sort of puts me a bit out of my, my style and my comfort zone to do such a thing. 
know that mass masters of conference talks i've heard in the past of them actually doing full hour-long half-hour talks with no slides i just can't imagine how stressful that would be uh, so let's say so during the talk you mentioned already that um they had told you right before lunch that you ran out a little bit of time so you had to pick up the pace so did you were you thinking of of like pitch or speed or rhythm or anything like that or were you like i'm just gonna wing this and just talk a little bit um uh, well so the slides themselves really don't have that much text on them there's some code examples and i think the largest code example and we're only dissecting pieces of the code example on each slide um might have been 30 lines of code and we're looking at two at a two at a slide right so there really wasn't that much. And so it's about how detailed I wanted to get. And one thing I wanted to make sure I did, and a lot of speakers uh, took a different approach, is they recommended that you leave the last 10 minutes for questions, but very few did. They usually used up the whole amount of time. I wanted to make sure I, I gave the full 10 minutes because I think that's probably the most important part of the talk, in all honesty, because you're watching, you're, you're essentially watching this, the you're you're what you're listening but you always have questions that are going to be that other people are going to have that maybe i didn't address and you know i i got some good questions and um i got to learn some stuff there's a guy who just schooled me in the audience and <laughs> i hope to see him next year up on stage but he's a, a brilliant guy and i talked with him after the fact but um you know i that was one thing i wanted to do so i could have probably gone at the pace i was expecting but i um maybe on some things that i would hammer down and like i had rant cards cards where i were just gonna rant about certain things and i couldn't rant as long as i wanted to to make my point so i just cut that back a little bit that's awesome so were you afraid though when when you got to the question and answer section because i think everybody gets a little nervous like long as if i messed up on a slide and some guy's gonna call me out on it or or some guy's gonna show me up or something or oh i got i got i got showed up twice uh wow. <laughs> but uh, well, more or less. So a question was asked by my buddy who came with me that what's a, what's some historical figure. That's a traitor. I don't, I can't remember anybody right now. Yeah, Benedict Arnold or that, um, at two Brute, you know, <laughs> there, there you go. Um, uh, uh, but yeah, so, um, uh, so which is he's trying to speak next year and don't you worry, I'm going to make sure I'm going to do my best to connect you and I'll be there with some tough questions, Patrick. Uh, but no, uh, um, and he asked, he asked about, um, basically my, my, a large portion of my talk was about protecting ourselves from um, API calls by making our data models more secure and um, more redundant, more or less. And uh, he asked about, well, if you, you're making some of this optional, is there any way to make this one field required? And I said, uh, based off my data model, I was like, you know, I, I never needed to do that, so I don't know. And then, um, you know, we... Uh, uh, my man, Benjamin, uh, who is just a genius after I talked to him for a bit, um, he he answered the question. Then Patrick follows another question, then answered a question. And I was like, I, it's so I think for some people, they might have been like a little, a little put off or <coughs> excuse me, a little bit nervous. But I I'm like taking notes in my head i was like yo man benjamin's got some good stuff here and i uh i talked with him after the fact he was a little bit worried he's like yo man i i hope i hope that wasn't like it was it was okay for me to speak up like that i i, I was like dude it, it's fine like <laughs> I'm, cool, I'm cool man and i appreciate it yeah cool so you're able to take it as like more like learning experience and didn't take offense so i know some speakers get, a lot of conferences don't even offer any sort of after talk questions so that's cool that this one did and and you guys were able to talk about it and yeah come up with a little better answer on on, on these little things here and there i hear you get you got that conference cough now oh my god i so naturally anytime i imagine you do a speaking engagement you're like gonna have a cold so i have a cold right now and like i've, I've had one for like the last two days and driving and staying up late and getting up early to go to and from the speaker's dinner and go to and from the conference hasn't been helpful at all <laughs> so it's uh it's uh that was another sort of challenge that went along with it <laughs> I, I was just getting over one i know it feels i know a lot of people go to conferences and then come back with colds that happens a lot too yeah, anytime well, so you get a bunch of people who don't shower too often no <laughs> <laughs>
that, that's I'm not trying to perpetuate right? the stereotype, but generally speaking, when you get a group of people together, there's at least one sick person who is to blame. It's just how it works. Oh, that was me this year. So anybody who went to Death Fest, yeah, Florida and, yeah, and left with a cold, I got you. <laughs> All right, l- let's switch gears here um, for those of you guys that are still listening that uh, love Dylan's story, but now you want to get into doing conference talks. Um, but let's talk about a few things that you should guys should do to do that. And we'd already mentioned the process. Um, really, to get, become a conference speaker, you like Dylan did, you have to submit some sort of proposal, either directly to the people that, that run the conference or using a more formal call for paper CFP process. And really, the only... Only people with that with fifty thousand Twitter followers or just insiders get asked to conferences, and most people listen. I would say before that even happens, make sure you go to some conferences, see what they're about, and experience it. See different, you know, different examples of how people give talks, so you have an idea is if this is right for you, and if it is, maybe an idea of how you're going to then organize your thought down the road. Sure, and also just living that kind of conference style. I know some people I've, I, there was a Twitter topic that went around a few weeks ago that a lot of conference, at least conference speakers are getting burned out. Um, what you tend to find is that with a lot of conferences, you see the same conference speakers all over the place. So if you have someone that's really good at speaking about angular or TypeScript, or you might see that same person at multiple different conferences and so you kind of have this group of, I don't know, 50 to 100 people, that maybe even less, that you just see everywhere. And one thing that there's this new position, and it's going a little off on a tangent, there's a new position that opening up in a lot of different companies. It's been around for a while. I shouldn't say it's really new. But it's dev- developer advocate. And it's kind of a weird combination. Not a weird, but it's a, just a different combination between a developer and someone that's kind of evangelizing the technology that their company is working for. So Microsoft has a bunch of developer advocates. So does uh, LinkedIn, Google, Facebook. I mean, they all have it. It's, it's funny you bring that up because uh, I don't know if we've talked about this. So you might have also heard them as a, uh, uh, like a developer evangelist or something like that. If you want to get like fancy na- tech name, but <laughs> um, that's actually something that I've considered doing at certain points where like, it's usually around the time I start hating my job at a company. And I was like, this is a good backup plan. But it does seem like something I would enjoy to do. And I, I think it's kind of a cool role, to be honest. Yeah. And one of the, usually one of the big things about these developer advocate roles is talking at conferences. And they get, and usually the conference helps pay for a lot of speakers to come. But almost all the time, developer advocates get sent by the company. The comp- their company pays for it. Too. And they, they're big into education and things like that. So let's let's move on. So usually the process, kind of as we hinted at before, you submit a CFP. It's usually months before the conference is even open. And sometimes they have a completely blind process, meaning they don't even look at anybody's names. And they just look at the pure topic, um, usually uh, the title of the, of the talk that you do and the abstract. And usually when you submit a CFP, it's a few hundred words at most. You don't really have to dig into it that deep when you submit it, but you do want to kind of explain what your talk is about. And you usually do want a a catchy title. And then most conferences have a conference committee, which then looks through all the different applications and then approves them. And a lot of times too, it depends if you need to be paid or not. So let me uh, go over travel for a second. Dylan just went to a conference and he was only a couple hours away, so he didn't really have to worry about travel. But a lot of conferences will pay for your travel. Um, some will, most will, but some don't. So you got to be careful. You got to kind of read through the, through the CFP process and how they pay their speakers. Uh, so usually what you'll get is a, um, the full conference Travel will be paid for. Sometimes it's a reimbursement. Some Most of the time it's a reimbursement. You have to pay for it yourself and then you get reimbursed later. Some will pay before, but I haven't heard that too often. And um, others will only cover like travel to and from the airport. And I know some European conferences only cover up to 500 euros of travel, which if you're in the U.S., that's really difficult to travel on a 
$500 budget. Usually they usually cover the hotel. I mean, usually your work pays for one or two conferences a year. Though, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, I'll be going to um, like NG Conf this year. My work's going to to pay for that. I've talked with them, and we gotta get it on the books, um, or ne- this coming year, I should say. Um, but yeah, I'll be going to some. Uh, I haven't. I didn't, it didn't even occur to me until we brought this up of being like, "Yo, what do you think about throwing your boy into one of the biggest conferences there is?" <laughs> Let's see how that goes. No, that'd be cool. So, in a lot of conferences, they usually some. It's a new newer trend. I've seen some conferences they leave one or two spots for brand new speakers. So it's not unheard of people who've never spoken before getting speaker spots or someone that's only done maybe very, very few or one. And do you think it's okay? Let me ask you this. I I really think it's okay, but do you think it's okay for to submit a conference talk for something you don't really know, but you really want to learn? It's kind of like conference driven development. I've heard it called. Uh, So, uh, I mean, if if that if you know exactly where you stand and you are uh you're like yo i'm about to fake it till i make it because that's what you just said um no i i think that's um i think it's it could be done without a doubt but what i would say is this uh i would say that when i go to conferences i want people who have been in problems i am in or i am going to be in to show me a direction or a solution. What I don't want is someone who wanted to simply advance their career and provide no value to the audience. And I'm not saying they're not going to provide any value. Um, but I, I, I do think that, that you're, you should be able to talk at a developer proficiency level about your thing. And you should be better than the audience, the, the general feel of the audience. You, don't, you ain't got to be better than everybody. But you got to be better than the general audience. And I, so I, I think that's kind of silly. That's just my stance. Yeah, I've heard it both ways. I've heard people that have, have, there's a topic that they know really well inside and out. And they do a conference talk and they submit a proposal. And then I've heard of people that know topics, they know of the topics, they know about it a little bit. And then they, they grind for the next three weeks, just deep diving into the topic, talk, looking at other talks about similar topics and then creating a topic on it. And it makes you learn it really well. I don't know if there's a right or wrong answer. I think Dylan has a good point that at the end of the day, you need to deliver value to the people watching the conference. And you want to be at a, a point where um, you know more, a lot more than them and that you're really helping them out. But there, there is different types of conference talks. Let's dive into that. Yours was probably more of a, I don't know, a new concept talk, like something that probably people had not thought about a lot, but there's also like a lessons learned talk. Like if you had done something inside your work and you thought that um, you wanted to teach it to everybody else, there's like my approach talk um, where it's like, this is what everybody else does. This is my approach to it. These are kind of similar topics or some, cause these are very similar, but they have some nuances between them. The complicated concepts explained like simply, like if you have a really, really complicated thing like you're looking at the javascript life cycle hook javascript life cycle and you want to kind of explain it more easily to everyone else and then there's like if the super interesting like deep end talk where you are just looking at one thing and you just deep dive into it i mean would you be able to categorize your talk into to one of these yeah i would say it'd be somewhere between a com- combination of the first one lessons learned talked and um complicated concepts explained and so part of that is the majority of my talk what we basically did was we went through about 30 slides of starting with the initial data model and then expanding upon that with a better solution better solution maybe a little bit of a worse solution things that we that i've done as i've been trying to go and take this data model that has was small then grew and make sure that it was extendable make sure that we inverted the dependencies. So I would say it probably falls somewhere in between there. Yeah. And, and these are not any, these are not the definitive talks you can do. There's still a lot more I actually crib these from um, a resource syntax.fm. They're a great podcast too. So they had a, some information about these in one of their episodes. So during the talk, let's jump into during talk. So let's say you have your, your conference talk down, maybe. And I think it's okay, too, you're, if you're taking a, a complicated, more of a beginner talk and you're kind of going into it a little bit more. I think 
talks like that are okay too. You don't always have to think of something no one's ever thought of before when you do your talk. Do you agree? Yeah. I, I mean, so I, I think that because the chances are you're probably not going to have this revolutionary talk, right? But you might have a different take on something or you might be able to emphasize certain things or um, discuss different pieces of it. Um, so I, at the end of the day, don't worry. It's, it, it's like one of those things, well, I don't want to build this web app because there's this other web app. It's like, dude, there's like 7 billion people or however many. <laughs> of course, there's going to be something else. Just do your thing. I mean, that pretty much wraps it up. Uh, there's a ton of resources, but I'll, I'll include in the show notes some of the resources. There's some GitHub, GitHub pages that have some really good notes on different front-end conferences that even break it down to which ones will pay for your travel and which ones won't. There's a couple of websites that just list uh, front-end conferences, which I'm assuming most of the people listening here are into front-end, but there's tons of back-end. There's tons of there's even some TypeScript conferences out there. Um, so I'll leave those in the notes for you guys to to take a gander at. And if you're on the fence about doing a conference talk, or you know, go to a few conferences and you know, start apply. Might you might be one day where Dylan is. Yeah, and and what I would say is, if you are thinking about it and you're kind of confused about what topic you're going to do about, it doesn't always have to be super technical. As I was talking to a lot of people, a lot of them were more interested in the less technical aspects of me of like, oh, how did you go from having no degree to, do, to going and working in software? That was some of the things that people are interested in. And some of the more interesting talks that I went to were about how to be effective team lead and stuff like that. So they don't necessarily always have to be very hard skilled. They just have to be relevant to people in the industry. And so do something that's relevant to you that you think you can help share with other people. Well, that's a really good point. I always think about conference talks. You think about, you know, I need to stand up in front of a stage for 40 minutes and explain this really complicated topic on some technical topic. But yeah, you could give life skills. If you can spin it and have a good narrative, you might be able to jump up there and do that. Yeah. All right, we'll uh, leave it at that. Thanks. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you want to find more about what I'm up to, go to dylanisrael.com. And if you want to know what I'm up to, you can check out my website at eric.video. If you haven't already, please leave us a five-star review on iTunes. It really helps us out. And if you do, you might even be featured on our next episode. Don't forget to check out the website at selftaughtornot.com. From there, you can sign up for a mailing list where we give away free courses and a bunch of cool stuff. And we'll also let you know when the next episode comes out. And finally, if you didn't know, we have a Facebook group. It's called Code Tech and Caffeine. We have over 10,000 members, and you can find the link at selftaughtornot.com. So come join us. We have tons of developers willing to help you guys, mentor you guys. Check it out. Just make sure you go to selftaughtornot.com and check out the Code Tech and Caffeine link. Thanks, and take care.